Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Melinda, and Paul, and Diane, I saw here, and to all the board members of CEDAR, and to all of you who've come along on this chilly Canberra morning. The voice <clears throat> is a bit husky this morning. It has part to do with the weather, but a big part to do with the blues. <laughs> well done to Boyd, Corden, and all the boys. And to all the Queenslanders, commiserations, but a great game. But that's not the topic for today. <clears throat> Well, not here at least, I should say. Everywhere else around the country, I suspect, at least on the eastern seaport, that's what they'll be talking about. Today we're talking about social and economic resilience. The essential services that Australians rely on. The quality of our schools and our hospitals. Medicare. Pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Our disability services. Our social safety net. Infrastructure that is critical to bus congestion, boost the livability of our cities and better connect our regions. All of it reliant upon, paid for, guaranteed by one thing, a stronger economy. This principle was central to the budget I delivered in May. It's central to the way the Turnbull government operates. It's an acknowledgement of the undeniable link between the strength of our economy and the ability of any government, anywhere, to deliver high quality and reliable services. And it's also, of course, the theme of this year's event. Without putting in place the right economic fundamentals, the task of building social resilience means you're playing uphill, you're playing into the wind, you're putting yourself at an almost un-overwhelming uh, ability to overwhelm that, that advantage that's been put against you. More than half the Commonwealth budget is dedicated to building social resilience, in fact far more than that. Record funding for our schools, record funding for our hospitals and our health services, a social welfare net to protect vulnerable Australians from being left behind. If you take economic growth for granted, if you seek to undermine economic growth through reckless policy or tax the economy within an inch of its life, you undermine your capacity to deliver the social safety net and supports that social re resilience depends upon. Without a strong economy, you can't afford the employment services like the Job Active Program or the Youth Path, which insists workers to transition, or in young people's case, through the PATH program, to come out of unemployment and get their first job and stay in that job. You can't afford to add life-saving drugs to the PBS, like Spinraza, or breakthrough medicines to treat breast cancer, as we listed in this year's budget. You can't afford to increase the amount of in-home care places for aged care, to give old Australians flexibility and choice and, dis and choices that they can make in their retirement, all provided for in this year's budget. A stronger economy pays for all of this and more. And a stronger economy is exactly what we are seeing. After a prolonged exit from the mining investment boom that dragged our economy, dragged on our economy for some five years and more, Australia has climbed back to the top of the Advanced Economy Global Leaderboard. Economic growth is now running at 3.1% through the year a rate that had puts us ahead of the major advanced economies of the world and above the average growth rate of the OECD, as we can see there, faster than every G7 economy. We have worked through what has been a very difficult period for our economy. It has adapted to life without that unprecedented stimulus of the mining investment boom. Around 80 billion of mining investment was stripped from our economy in the years following the peak of the boom in 2012. That was a far bigger shock than the GFC. Far bigger. I don't wish to downplay the significance of the GFC. We all know its impact globally. But when it came to Australia, the most significant economic event that we have had to deal with as an economy has been the withdrawal back from the mining investment boom. $80 billion 
of mining investment stripped out of our economy. Yet despite that, our economy continued to grow. That's what I call resilience. Our economy and our finances are now more resilient than they have been at any time since the GFC. Our economy is now more broad-based in its growth. In the latest national accounts, all major components of the economy were contributing to growth in that quarter. Non-mining business investment continued its recent strength, growing by 10% in the last 12 months. That's five times the long-run average, with eight consecutive quarters of growth. Now, that's the longest continuous growth we've seen in non-mining investment since the start of the mining investment boom. The budget is now forecast to run return to balance in 2019-20, a year ahead of what we'd previously anticipated. We have turned the corner on net debt and from this year are beginning to pay down that net debt. Now you say to me, why are you talking about net debt? Well, A, when you recall the Howard and Costello government and they paid off the debt, it was the net debt they paid off. That $96 billion we all remember, that was net debt. When it comes to gross debt, two budgets ago, I talked about the importance between good debt and bad debt. The only reason we're borrowing today has to do with funding important infrastructure programs, but also to ensure that we don't raid the future fund. Now, those who, who make commentary on gross debt should understand this. If you wanted the same trajectory as that you have on net debt, which pays down by $30 billion over the next four years and down by $230 billion and more to less than 4% of GDP over the next 10, then you have to raid the future fund. So next time you hear people saying, oh, gross debt should be doing this or that, they have one option to them, raid the future fund. Now, if you raid the future fund, what you do is you remove the future fund's ability to do its job which is to cover off the unfunded superannuation liabilities over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And the advice is very clear. If you touch that future fund in the next 10 years, you will basically extinguish it before you extinguish the liabilities. So it's very important, very important, that you maintain the discipline to not go and raid that cookie jar over there in the future fund. Net debt's coming down. That's what determines our net interest payments. That's what impacts on the budget in terms of those payments that we need to make and they will come down similarly as we see the net debt recede as a result of returning the budget to balance. And an improved fiscal position obviously ensures that our financial resilience as a government, for a, as a government, as an economy is enhanced. We have addressed the build up and the risks in the housing market through carefully calibrated macro prudential policies and other initiatives I announced in last year's budget. That's been taking the heat out and ensuring house price movements are on a more sustainable footing and that's been done without impacting on the restoring markets in some of the weaker capitals when it comes to house price growth elsewhere around the country. It's the problem of taking a sledgehammer of tax to the housing market is that it indiscriminately hits everything everywhere. But the approach we've taken with the more calibrated approach has had great success and has been recognised as such. Our businesses have been, limit, limit, have been liberated to grow their operations, invest in their future and hire more Australians, energised by our legislated tax cuts for small and medium-sized businesses. With a turnover up to 50 million, the instant asset write-off continues, the cutting of red tape for around 2.7 million small businesses, in particular simplifying the GST our compliance from three pages to just three questions. The doors to the world have been open for our exporters with new trade deals, including the comprehensive and progressive agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the reason we don't say that too often is it's easy to say TPP 11. And that demonstrated, I think, above all, our resilience as a government when it came to fighting for um, export trade access for Australians. And that was an extraordinary achievement by the Prime Minister backed in by his ability in where, where few other world leaders have been able to achieve this, if any, of being able to ensure, particularly in relation to aluminium and steel tariffs, that the Prime Minister was able to maintain the strength of Australia's position with the US. And of course, the resilience we're seeing in our jobs market, record jobs growth, 75% of those jobs were full-time. 
not casual jobs, not part-time jobs. 75% were full-time, and the trends on casualisation have been largely unaltered. Over a million jobs created since we first came to government. So my point is this. I said a stronger economy is what you need, and a stronger economy is what we're getting. Our plan for a stronger economy is working, and that's why we need to stick to the plan. The plan not only involves encouraging and fostering growth through the suite of our positive economic policies, but it means removing the impediments to growth, the inhibitors that hold our economy back and can hold our economy back, looking forward to see what those impediments will be. Now, in our view, and I think it's a widely shared view, <coughs> one of the greatest of those impediments, if not the greatest, is the growth in uncompetitive taxes. Our taxes are too high and tax revenues are now increasing once again as a share of our economy. Now, there must be a limit, a control, on just how much tax you are prepared to have your economy bear. And that is why we impose the tax speed limit in this year's budget, expressed as a, a share of GDP, <coughs> set at 23.9% and that was based on the post-GST pre-mining boom period. If you're not prepared to control your taxes, it actually tells you you're not prepared to control your spending. And that's, of course, why Labor have abandoned their view on the tax speed limit. They used to say 23.7, in fact. They said that was our test for a government. And now they don't want to have the discussion at all. <coughs> Pardon me. And it's incredibly important that if you wish to control expenditure into the future, you can't give yourself the leave pass that every time you can't control your expenditure, you just chuck ta jack taxes up. You can't do that. You can't do that if you run a business. So it's important that if you want to protect and have resilience in your finances into the future, you can't allow any government to have the leave pass of just being able to jack up taxes whenever they feel like, without good cause. And a good cause is, no, we can't control our spending. And so, as Treasurer, with the Finance Minister and others, this is an important discipline on government as much as anything else, that we're prepared to actually put ourselves under that sort of control. And if you're not prepared to put yourselves under that control, well, I think it says a lot about where you rate financial management as a key indicator of the uh, plan that you pursue as a government. So our tax system must also reward effort. It must support working Australians who are trying to get ahead. It must not penalise those who want to do better, get a pay rise, work more hours, take on extra shifts, either because they wish to or they need to, and by asking them to pay ever-increasing rates of tax at the same time. That's not a good deal for them. The more effort they put in incrementally, the more tax they have to pay by facing higher marginal rates. And that's why we've been in the position where we have been in over the last six months to fashion a personal tax plan that dealt with these issues. And we are making some significant progress. Last week, successful passing of our personal income tax plan is a significant win for all working Australians. We have ensured that all Australians paying tax will be better off as they go into this next decade. They'll enter a decade of paying less tax and they will be rewarded for their hard work, both now and into the future. As the chart says, it's lower and it's fairer and it's simpler and it's legislated. All-inclusive plan, a responsible plan, starting with tax relief for low and middle, middle income earners, dealing with bracket creep, making the system simpler. Now, that's a plan, saving average wage earners thousands of dollars in coming years. And by completely abolishing the 37 percent, 37 cent tax bracket. Now, remind me of when was the last time we've actually abolished a whole tax bracket in this country. Talk a lot about reform. It's been a long time. Someone's hard to do that in a long time. And we were able to pass that through the parliament. 94 percent of Australians will not face a marginal tax rate of higher than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. Every extra dollar they earn, every extra hour they get, every extra shift they do they won't have to pay that higher marginal tax rate. Now, all that is made possible by a stronger economy and keeping our economy strong. If you're earning just over $75,000, that's less than the average full-time wage in this country. 
you will face a higher marginal tax rate under the alternative that was put forward last week than what you will under our plan. Because Labor last week said they wanted to cut $144 billion worth of tax relief for Australians in half. You, they will pay that 37 cents. If you're earning just over about $75,000 today, you will pay 37 cents into the future under the alternative plan. If you're earning $85,000 today, if you're earning $90,000 today, if you're earning $95,000 today, you will pay that higher 37 cent under the alternative plan in this country, cutting $70 billion of tax relief for Australians over the next decade. And so they will be in the position of going into the next election telling 9 million Australians and their families that they are taking away $70 billion of tax relief for them. And that's in addition, by the way, to the $200 billion in new and higher taxes they have already announced and flagged that they pr are proposing to put on the Australian economy. Now, this week, our focus shifts back once again to legislating the full implementation of our enterprise tax plan, extending the legislated tax cuts for businesses up to $50 million in turnover currently to all businesses, benefiting the nine out of 10 Australian workers who work in the private sector. You want to boost economic growth? Well, let businesses invest more of the earnings that they are able to achieve back into their business, buying new machinery, hiring more Australians, taking on new markets and new opportunities and paying their workers more. I mean, the counterfactual to corporate tax relief, making our company taxes more competitive, it just doesn't bear up. How on earth does a business invest more, employ more, do more, if they have to pay more to the government? I mean, whatever you think about anything else, that just doesn't add up. If you force them to pay more to the government, that clearly can't make them more competitive. And the evidence backs this up. Treasury's economy-wide modelling suggests taking our company tax rates from 30 to 25 per cent would generate a sustained permanent increase in the level of GDP of of around about 1 per cent, just over. The IMF has published modelling that estimated in the, if the US, Germany and France cut corporate taxes, um, real GDP in each economy would increase by almost 4 per cent after 10 years with other changes. Businesses would invest more. Profits would be sh shifted into economies that were reducing their tax rates, the IMF claimed. While profound on the upside, the downside painted by the IMF was a stark warning to countries that failed to make business taxes more competitive. They would face a reduction in GDP by around 1 per cent. That's just by doing nothing. So if we do this, our economy will be bigger. If we don't do it, then growth will suffer. That's the choice that is before the parliament this week. And growth is not an end in itself. Economic growth guarantees the essential services that all Australians rely on. So it is an important decision for our parliament this week. It is a test of whether this parliament believes that a stronger economy is what Australians need to guarantee their jobs, to provide a future for them and their families, for the businesses that employ them, to make sure that they can guarantee on the services that they rely on into the future that only a stronger economy can sustain. Our uncompetitive high company tax rate is increasingly holding us back from realising stronger economic growth and jobs. The OECD have said corporate income taxes are the most harmful for growth as they discourage the activities of firms that are most important for growth, <coughs> investment in capital and productivity improvements. Around three million Australian businesses are paying more competitive tax rates courtesy of our legislated tax cuts, businesses that employ around one in two Australians, just over in fact. What we're seeking to do is extend those tax arrangements, those more competitive taxes, to a further 6,000 businesses. So from over 3 million to a further 6,000 companies that have a turnover in excess of $50 million. And now <clears throat> that might not sound like a lot of businesses, at 6,000, but we know that those businesses make up an, an extraordinarily large part of our economy. They employ around 4 million Australians, working in businesses that are still stuck at those uncompetitive rates at 30 per cent. Now, these are workers behind the till of the supermarket. They're flight attendants guiding you to your seat. They're the truck driver you pass on the freeway. They're labourers 
working on the infrastructure projects and the buildings that have sky, um, cranes littering our skylines presently and making our cities more livable, ultimately. Now, why should their prospects, why should those employees be working for companies that pay higher rates of tax when other employees are working for companies that are paying lower rates of tax? How are they different to the seven million other Australians working in those smaller to medium-sized businesses? And these businesses at more than 50 million are not multinational juggernauts. Back in May after the budget, I went up to Rocky and I met Gary and Julie Coxon and they run a family mechanical service business <coughs> in central Queensland. And from next week, they will receive their first tax cut as part of our legislated enterprise tax plan. They have a turnover of just under $50 million. But the question is how long will they be able to qualify for that because they're not doing too bad. Here's a great mechanical services business in central regional Queensland expanding. It's a great story because within just 12 months, if they keep on that path that they're currently on, <coughs> their family business will tick over that 50 million mark and they'll go back to paying 30 cents in the dollar. Not just the bit over 50 million, but from dollar one. They're not bankers in suits. They're not Facebook or Amazon executives. They run a successful radiator business in a blue shed on the outskirts of Rocky. They employ 35 workers and they rip the front off mining trucks and replace the radiators with a modular variety. I'm no engineer, but these radiators are about as, almost as high as going up to the floor of this, this room. And the tax relief they're about to receive, which they say will go towards more jobs and higher wages for their workers, that'll soon be gone. Even worse, our opponents, the alternative, are already committed to reversing our legislated tax cuts to business, reversing 60 billion away from small and medium-sized businesses like Coxon's radiator services today. Their policy is any business with a uh, turnover above two million will go back to paying the 30 cents in the dollar. Now, we do not believe that's an incentive to create jobs or lift wages. In addition to their own modelling of our enterprise tax plan, Treasury have engaged external advisors, KPMG and Independent Economics, to provide analysis on the effects of a tax plan. Both showed significant increases in investment, some 1.6 to 2.7%, and wage growth of between 0.4 and 1.4%. There is also a case made <coughs> by a Professor of Economics at the at uh, Richard Holden, who cites empirical study by three German economists published in the flagship American Economic Review that reviewed 18,000 tax changes across 10,000 jurisdictions between 1993 and 2012. It's a pretty comprehensive study. It showed company tax cuts provided a benefit to businesses and workers in relatively equal measure. Professor Holder noted that the cutting of Australia's company tax rate from 30% to 25% is not just good for business and workers, he says it also helps redress economic inequality. The benefits to workers, he said, tend to flow disproportionately to women, young people and the less skilled. Of course, it isn't just the larger companies and their workers that stand to benefit from the more competitive tax rates. It's the army of small businesses that occupy an important place in our supply chain. It's the classic analogy of the rising tide lifts all boats. The suppliers, the contractors, the producers, they all stand to gain because they're part of the business ecosystem. Take a company like Qantas. We're talking about a supply chain of 13,000 businesses. Boutique wineries, bakers, designers, dairies, freight companies. It's a microcosm of the economy, Qantas's supply chain. All serving the interests of one company, at the end of the day, serving their customers. And if we require uncompetitive tax rates of that company, then it's obviously going to flow through into the rest of the economy as in a disadvantage. Trade between big businesses and small businesses in 2015-16, according to the Business Council, <coughs> pardon me, was a colossal $555 billion. That's 555 billion reasons why Australia businesses should all have competitive tax rates, not just some. Now, aside from the benefits to the economy 
and Australian workers, there are clear risks involved in keeping our businesses anchored to what is now one of the highest tax rates in the OECD. And it's this, other nations will just simply cut our lunch. When Australia cuts its rate to 30% in 2001, there were 19 OECD countries with a higher company tax rate than us. Now there are only two. And when France's legislated company tax cut takes effect, Australia will be the second highest amongst advanced economies, just ahead of Portugal. Now Portugal have Ronaldo and are going to great guns in the World Cup. But when you look at the OECD Economic Leaderboard, you won't find Portugal. This will leave Australian business at a significant disadvantage compared to our competitors who are benefiting from a 19% tax rate in the UK, a 17% rate in Singapore, and on average a combined federal and state rate of around 25% in the US. We are running at a disadvantage to those companies. Our global peers have long grasped the notion of competitive corporate rates. In fact, when I first announced this plan in the 2016 budget, both France and the United States hadn't even started going down this path. At that time, we had the opportunity to strike some distance. And now, we're having to play catch-up. That's the lost opportunity of the last few years. You know, people say... <coughs> Bill Shorten talks a lot about the big end of town. He's often saying how terrible they are and all the rest of it. But you know who the biggest supporter of the bigger end of town is? It's actually Bill Shorten. But the only problem, it's not in our town and it's not in our country. He's the supporter of the big end of town in Paris, in London, in Tokyo, in New York, in Singapore, in all of these places, because he wants their firms to operate on a more competitive tax rate than businesses here in Australia. At the end of the day, this issue of business taxes being more competitive is about that, competitiveness, ensuring that our businesses are competitive and ensuring that our businesses, regardless of their side, size, are able to go out there and win for Australia. And it is galling, and I won't labour it this morning because this is a, as we heard in the end introduction, uh, a non-partisan forum. But you all do know, because they've all turned up at your forums and they've all said from our opponents how much they've said reducing company tax rates is important. It's quite a role. The Finance Minister, Jim Chalmers, the Shadow Treasurer, Chris Bowen, Bill Shorten himself has said it on numerous occasions, both as a Minister for Financial Services and other capacities. In said, as we know, any student of Australian business and economic history since the mid-1980s knows that part of Australia's success was derived through the reduction in the company tax rate, he said. Wayne Swan thought it was a great idea. Standing next to Kevin Rudd, Julie Gillard thought it was a good idea. Now, all of them couldn't agree on anything, but they agreed on one thing, that company taxes should be lower. What does it say that if you're prepared to say that then but not act on it now, what does it say on the other side of an election how they'd run the show? We believe business tax in this country should be lower and more competitive across the board, but it also should be paid. As a government, we have taken a leadership role around the world in combating multinational tax avoidance. $7 billion a year now is back in the sales of sales, is now back in the tax net in Australia that wouldn't have happened otherwise. <clears throat> this is in addition to the $5 billion raised through our various other tax integrity measures since 2016. The multinational anti-avoidance legislation, the diverted profits tax, companies avoiding tax by shifting it overseas will pay a 40% penalty rate. We've seen tax being paid by some of the large tech multinationals around doubling since we've been able to bring in these new measures. We were opposed in these things, but we press on. And one of the areas where we've been particularly successful is improving the integrity of the GST base. Now, next year alone, states and territories will receive around about $1.9 billion in higher GST revenues right across the board because of the integrity measures we put in when it comes to GST. 
most controversial of which lately has been that um, there will be no tax holiday on GST uh, for overseas firms selling into Australia goods of less than $1,000. Now, that levels the playing field, makes sure that all goods and services are subject to the same taxes. When the GST was first introduced, the volume of those sales was almost inconsequential. It barely existed. But today it's become a big deal. And so we've taken the decision, again opposed and opposed and opposed, but we've been able to persist and make sure that these things have been achieved. And in coming weeks, I'll be releasing a further paper on digital taxation, the new economy, <coughs> which we'll be discussing again when I go to the G20 uh, next month to discuss these issues. And this, the goal is simple. When our tax systems globally were set up, they were set up for the old economy. And all the economies are trying to do now, and this is why we have to work in partnership with the other countries around the world, is to have a tax system that works in the new economy. So we can draw the reasonable revenue that is necessary to support the essential services um, that all economies are seeking to deliver for their citizens. And so we will discuss those issues at the next G20 meeting once again as we try and eke our way forward. <clears throat> and it is important that we try and move together because if we move together, it provides less opportunities for companies to find other ways around the system. And so we're working very hard on building that consensus. Multinational tax avoidance is a multi-jurisdictional challenge, and that's the way we've been working at it. And we've been having great success working with our peers, country by country, reporting. All of these things are now happening. They weren't happening three years ago. They are all happening now. And these companies are increasingly engaging with the Taxation Office, with the Treasury and others, and realigning their corporate structures and the way they do things to ensure that the tax that should be paid in Australia is being paid in Australia. The whistle's been blown on this, and it's been blown by our government, and we've been getting on and doing it. So, yes, we believe company taxes should be more competitive, but we believe they should be paid. And in the same way, the personal taxes should be lower, simpler and fairer, but they should be paid, and they should be paid by everyone who has that liability. And so integrity of your tax base, where we've done an enormous amount of work, is necessary to, I think, give Australians confidence that as you're seeking to run a tax system along the lines that I've displayed and demonstrated this morning, it's also one they can have confidence in and you need to continue to work on that. <clears throat> so just wrapping up. We're talking about social resilience, we're talking about economic resilience, but you can't have the social resilience without the economic resilience. And that's why our government is focused on a stronger economy. We are delivering a stronger economy and we have a plan to deliver one and it is working and that's why we need to stick to it. Tax relief to encourage and reward hard-working Australians. Backing business to invest and create more jobs. Guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on. Keeping Australians safe and ensuring that the government lives within its means. That's our plan. That's the plan we're sticking to. That's the plan that's working. It's enabling more and more Australians to plan for their future with confidence in what is a very uncertain world. Yes, the global economy has been on the uptick. It has been improving, but we're all very aware of the risks that are out there. And that's why it's important we stick to the plan to ensure that we can continue to have the resilience that delivers not only the prosperity that Australians work hard for, but the society that we are celebrated for all around the world. Thank you very much for your attention.